Hello and welcome to a new episode of Foodocracy for Her. And today I'm going to be speaking to Natasha Chenmi, who's uh, joining in from Bangalore or Bengaluru. And there's little Yinki, my kitten, who's over here, who wants to do the podcast. <laughs> so it's like, okay, okay, you can't do the podcast. <laughs> he's okay, he's all over me. He's drinking from my water glass. So, <laughs> so he remind me not to drink from that. Okay, sorry. Okay, this is uh, the beauty of working from home, which I'm sure everyone's uh, discovering. Okay, listen, uh, before I continue with the rest of the interview, I want to show you guys uh, what I had for lunch. And, and there's a connection with the interview. So let me see if you can uh, see this. Uh, okay, so this, uh, Natasha, in case you're wondering. It's, what is it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So it's, it's um, got something to do with your book, uh, which is uh, this one, fast, fresh, flavorful, everyday meals made easy, vibrant, vegetarian, and that's her name, Natasha Chelmi. Okay, so this is, uh, yeah. So this is a pomfret I made, so it's not vegetarian, okay. uh, in a tomato sauce. This is in a black rice and chia pasta. That's pretty hipsterish, but uh, Aditi uh, Limaya Kamath, who's a chef, here, uh, she uh, she makes the pasta, so I use that. And then I made one uh, without um, uh, the pasta, which is nice, this one. Yeah, I'm gonna show you this. So this is just the pomfret and uh -huh. uh, carrots and uh, sliced onion. So let me tell you the story oh. behind this, and I'll also introduce Natasha to that. So uh, Natasha has written this book. Uh, uh, it's fast, fresh, flavorful. Uh, and it's also a uh, gourmand uh, cookbook winner uh, as uh, recently as 2020. So um, what happened was that uh, in, in Mumbai, we've gone, to, gone into a sort of lockdown and, uh, you know, with restaurants and everything shut. So the first thought in uh, our mind yesterday was that let's call up uh, Poonam, who's the lady who sells uh, fish at Car Fish Market from whom we buy fish. And I called her and then she didn't deliver before the fish before the lockdown. But she does now. Uh -huh. uh, initially, she used to come herself, but she's quite resourceful. These Maharashtrian Kohli ladies, like like you, Marwaris are. So Natasha Chelmi uh, is uh, Marwari. We'll figure out why Chelmi. And, uh, and uh, you know, there's, 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 there's so now she sends it with an auto guy. So I call for some palm trade, Pabda, you know, Pabda. Uh, then uh, Surmai, you know, Rawas and prawns. Then she said the katla is not too good today. So I said okay. Then I wanted to make a Parsi dish called Tamatar Ni Matsi, which uh, Kenaz used to make in the beginning of our uh, early years of our wedding. She's Parsi. I, I didn't like it too much then because Natasha, since you've grown up in Calcutta, you'll, you'll know that we don't have too much of tomatoes in our food, like we Bengalis, no. right? Yeah, you're right. So, and, and I would find it too, uh, this thing. And, and it took me a while to even like the, uh, take a liking to the tomato-based Italian uh, sauces. Yeah. And that also, as, uh, as you will know, it's because in commercial places in India, and in restaurants, they put in a lot of sugar, sometimes even color and, and all that. So that, you know, but I've been like experimenting a lot uh, at home during the lockdown and with puree packs and all that. So I was, I was just, um, so I thought I'll make a tomato based sauce, put in the pomfret, frit, cook it together, have mine on pasta, hers without. Um, and, and I was also flipping through your uh, book, which I've been reading through the weekend. And you had a recipe for uh, a spaghetti. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So you, you had a base re recipe for a tomato sauce. And over there, and I mean, I didn't go through details, but I saw that, it, it, you know, there was mention of rosemary, uh, chili peppers, and, and then onion. Now, I've been cooking a bit of uh, tomato sauce based uh, pastas during the lockdown, but no onions per se. I mean, uh, except when it was with meat. So I said, okay, let me put some kanda uh, piaz in it. And, and I opened the, uh, you know, the onion section in the kitchen. And uh, look at the um, uh, sort of, it's a uh, coincidence, uh, or, you know, provenance, like they say, a provenance. I opened it and there was a white onion. Okay. So, which we rarely have in our kitchen. We normally have the normal red onion, the normal, the same. And, and white onion, of course, works much better for a, a thing. And, and it sliced it and it gave a beautiful body. So no, no starch, no sugar, uh, whatever. And, and then I saw some chopped carrots in the fridge that I put in. So it is also vibrant 
uh, vegetarian and and it worked out uh, very well so my wife was on a work call um so i slipped in her plate to her and i sat and took uh, had my plate and i decided to go off uh, instagram from last night till this evening when i posted because sunday was very hectic but listen this interview is about you and i'm just talking about myself <laughs> so, so i'm like <laughs> about you tomato yeah, so, experience <laughs> so i use so, only local desi tomato huh if you do try the sauce out sometime yeah so i i I I I use a uh, so you know my wife is doing most of the shopping these days and she goes a bit mad on online whereas we used to I used to like I I'm a I'm more a brick and mortar person so I like to go to the grocery shop so at one point she had to buy uh, tomato puree and she bought some three four packs in in the fridge and now we get fresh tomato so we're not using it so I use that uh, I mean very desi tomato some puree some fresh or something like that nothing Uh, you know, San Moranzo or San Moranzo. No, but just the simple. You yes. get the best flavors from the desi. Get them overripe. Buy the overripe tomatoes. And yes. So, so, yeah. so um, uh, we have a Calcutta connection. So, so you're a Calcutta girl. Yes. But, but uh, are you? Are you? You're not Bengali, but you're Bengali at heart. I'm a Bengali so, at heart, and I'm Ish. I'm a Bangla boy. I'm a Bangla. Pora shona shop kori. If you want to talk more in Bong, carry on. <laughs> Yeah, that, I, that'll get us more views because I think vernacular gets more views than English. But, definitely. Um, I'm a Bangla kotha bolta hai. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm a Malwari by birth, but I'm born and brought up in Calcutta, and my family's been in Calcutta for the last three generations. I'm now in Bangalore, so very much a Calcutta girl and a Bangali at heart, if that's what you. Mean. Yeah, so that's that's an inter- interesting career progression because as we talk later, we'll uh, sort of see that um, like one of the main interests is on. Italian food, and and which also is a bit of the genealogy of Chef uh, Ritu Dhamia because she's also Manwari from Calcutta, and uh, Italian food is really her forte, and and a bit of uh, and and Asian as well, and that's what you. She was my uh, inspiration when she had her TV show Italian Khana, and I was like, okay, maybe I'm not the only <laughs> psycho Manwari who wants to go to Italy and you know explore and learn to cook, because I was tired of basic Khana, yeah. And and Marwari is today, uh, and you know, like from my generation onwards, uh, I think were like far more exposed to international influences. They would, uh, so like when when I was a school kid, then the impression one had of Marwaris in in Calcutta were like, uh, you know, the businessmen from uh, Border Bazaar, and the and the, you know the the wives would not uh, work, and and they were considered to be more on the plumper side because they would have a lot of. And he <laughs> and uh, you know and running the sari shops and stuff. But uh, you know, by the time I was in college and then uh, working, I was in Calcutta for about a year. So I'm talking about the late nineties. Uh, there were a lot of people um, in in the service industry who were Marwaris. Like I remember, there was a dentist we used to go to who was Marwari, and many other people. So so that that generation was getting into like education and service, or taking the family business into. And and I think that showed in the food also, right? I mean, Natasha, like that's a feel which I get that the Calcutta yeah, Marwari we was in far more expensive. I guess. I mean, I went to Italy for work. I was so I was, as you said, one of the younger gen, modern generation. My parents were very forward thinking. Um, you know, we were just two sisters. I didn't have a brother, so my my dad it was always that I have to learn business. And so my family, um, my dad owns this company called Rolic Ice Cream, which you would have probably yes, 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 it was. <laughs> uh it was it opened when i was in school so there's so much excitement after be, being exposed only to quality 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 yeah. and for me you know i i come into uh, india when i was 8 or 9 years old and suddenly come into a market where there was only one company which was quality and very basic flavors from england was quite a so rolic was very exciting i remember yes it, at that time it was and we were kids it was our claim to fame in school <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, so dad, thought, my dad wanted me to. Um, I was in the UK at college. Uh, I went to university there. You know, business again, Marwari, so business degree. You know, करना है. Um, but the whole idea was कि कुछ नया शुरू करो, get something new in the same industry, and bring it back, mm-hmm. and you start it. And that's when I came across Italian gelato, and the whole thing was, how do you do it? We were the first brand, two thousand five. And that's how it happened. So if you're talking about enterprising Marwari girls and not getting married and you know opening tiny shops, <laughs> so I was one of them. And I then got into and today I'm a chef, which is completely, you know, not Marwari. I cooking non-veg. So, uh, so which which year was this? When when the 
gelato part of it started and what was it called it was called mama mia mama mia gelato it started in 2005 in kolkata um the brand is still there but i sold it in 2013 I think even in Mumbai it had opened yeah, in Bangalore. Yeah, it had expanded into Bangalore and Mumbai. Um mm-hmm. so it was a completely new concept. People had not had, you know, they were still used to the strawberry no strawberry essence yes. dado, vanilla mein essence wo kuch ka essence dado and you know ice cream ban gaya. Um so gourmet ice cream with fresh fruits, um you know, I was importing some flavors from Italy, the lemon pulp and stuff, lemon sorbet, uh, mm-hmm. Ferrero Rocher. and that i would make the gelato in the mornings at a little you know lab at the back very italian style go in the morning whip it all up um, yes. literally fold my so i don't have a degree i went to a factory in italy mm. and i literally folded up my sleeves and the guy said okay you put on you know put a little zucker and you put a little bit of this and you get gelato came back started it off you know i was 22 i was 22 wow years. wow so that's the yeah that's the you know marwari business sense I remember those days because um, I remember the, the first gelato place which we came across in Mumbai was a place called Mia Amore, in, uh, which opened in Bandra, where I stay. And there was an Italian uh, gentleman who ran it, and I think his father-in-law was a gelato maker in uh, the in Italy, and he won awards or whatever, you know. So it was, and and there was this whole aura around gelato, like you know, yeah. they, they, those guys were pretty French in the, in the sense that. they would insist that you have to have the ice cream in the shop because they would say that uh, if you if you step out it'll melt so forget delivery you couldn't take it home also in the beginning then they had to <laughs> sort of run the business <laughs> but i i remember the times when um you know we wanted to have it later at night at home so we go and buy it and then we step stepping out of the door and they said so 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 you can't take it out so i said you know we just want to stand out and you know watch the sea the carter road and have it this step out and Quickly get into the car, which is parked outside. Drive home. <laughs> you know, I saw a whole gelato which you bought, but you'd have to do a gelato heist <laughs> with that, which is pretty uh, uh, funny. So, um, how how was that experience of uh, uh, creating uh, gelato and uh, and in two thousand five in Calcutta, which was still a fairly, uh, I think, a conservative desert market because there was only um, quality when it came to ice creams and. Yeah. uh you know even in de- deserts it was still fruities there was no uh, mrs macpie and all of that so it was still fruities and monjinis and this thing and then all the mishti dukan cookie jar of course we grew up on cookie jar in kakta um no so the thing what i believe is you catch a virgin market hmm. as compared to a crowded market and people will lap it up you know um people loved it i had a good product and because it's a small market I think people were craving something exciting, um, and it's not a crowded market where I had to compete too much. So honestly, we did have monopoly in Calcutta. So I, as a business person, I would always look at a level B city, um, where which is not saturated. And if you see uh, Calcutta as a market, it's also a market where uh, like people are really into food, but but it's just that sometimes people hold on to. Uh, like for example, uh, when it comes to continental, uh, people would hold on to the Park Street, Mukambo, uh, Peter Cat sort yeah. of orientation of it. But even that at that time, at one time, would have been uh, new. Yeah. But uh, so then you now the food scene is buzzing. I mean, I I left a long time ago. I I go back. My parents are there. Yeah. But uh, it's buzzing now. So can... it's buzzing. But you know, I I don't know if it's like that for you. But once you become a Pravasi, it's it's really nostalgia which feels. <laughs> so especially when you're going for short trips, yeah. then either you want to have uh, your home food, uh, or like the restaurants you've sort of grown up on. So so sure. you hang on to the uh, Batsha rolls and the. Sure. You know, I so do the same now. Yeah. Now that I live in Bangalore, I do the same. <laughs> yes. So uh, then, um, how did Bangalore happen from Calcutta? You went to, so so. Europe, uh, sorry, England to Calcutta, right? Yeah, England to study. I went to the Warwick University. I did my undergrad hmm. there. Yeah, and then and uh, then you went, came back so to Calcutta. I was in my last year of college, and I got this light bulb of okay, gelato, and you know, I did a case study on Hagen Dazs. So if you pay attention to your oh, yeah, yeah. classes, you know, you might get a light bulb. <laughs> yeah. So that happened. Then I was based in Calcutta, and then we expanded our stores into Bangalore and Mumbai. And uh, yes, that was Mama Mia. And then I, in 2013, I sold the brand. Okay. Grew it into a pan India store. And why was that? Was that the plan, 
or uh, I mean, how, I'm interested yeah, to see like how business. business. Uh, it was, it, it's meant to be carried on to the next generation. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, but well, um, as a woman, um, I reached a point where I met my husband. Uh, he's Italian, and uh, he, I met him in Bangalore. So, so hence, hence, tell me and not. Hence, otherwise. tell me. Yes, exactly. So that yeah, because I look totally Indian, so people are curious. Uh, but no, I was very inspired by Italy. So I spent a lot of time in Italy before I met him. I was speaking the language at the Italian consulate in Calcutta. I took lessons for four years. Um, so I was very fascinated by Italy and its culture and everything. Um, but anyways, coming back to my life. Yeah, so I met uh, my husband, Luigi. And, you know, they say for love or for money, you reach a crossroad. And he said, listen, I'm not here all my I'm set to leave, you know, next year, expat life. And but what I want to say from business point of view is every business has a life cycle and it had been nine years. Hmm. And you know, there was competition and people move on. So I said, I'm at this point where either I put in a lot of money and you know, make a redo the branding and everything, hmm. or I'm gonna start losing money soon. And um, I also wanted to get on with the family. So you can't give everything attention. It's ka time with that. So I have a good brand value, sold the brand for a premium and decided to enjoy life a bit. Yeah, but I, I found that very interesting because, you know, when I do these chats uh, uh, with, uh, with women who are entrepreneurs, it's, it's more about their life as entrepreneurs than just the uh, uh, women part of, woman part of it. So I found what you said pretty interesting that, you know, uh, that a brand has a certain life cycle yeah. and then you either sort of see if you want to sort of expand it and take it to the next stage or, or like I said, I mean, milk that and then uh, do whatever you want to do uh, next, and and this um, this uh, entire thing of being an entrepreneur is still uh, new to a lot of uh, people who are taking it up now, and and uh, you know the earlier way of thinking is that whether it's a business or a job, you're in it, uh, you know till it, uh, till you retire, and probably your children and grandchildren will be in the same trade. Yeah. So uh, we see that in the corporate sector where people change jobs like often in a year or something like that. And, and I think even in business to look at it this way, or, or even people who are freelance, like, uh, you know, you, you created content in a certain way, but you might want to then um, look at what next. And, and that's that's very interesting. So yeah, so you went to Italy before marriage. Uh, so, uh, right, and, and what, what were you doing in Italy then? So I used to keep going to Italy for Mamma Mia work and I had suppliers there, machinery suppliers, ingredients, and I would go for retraining. And that's when, um, you know, we, get out of, we got into patisserie as well. And uh, that is when I got to eat Italian food, you know, which was a real Italian food and not the Mocambo and Peter Cat. <laughs> <laughs> not the fish a la Diana and oh, uh, fish and dairy, and by the way. fish and cheese. It's like absolute no-no for Italians. Yes. Like which, which, I, which I sort of realized when I... Uh, went to Italy myself, so so no cheese in the spaghetti no. seafood pasta. It's like no, not at all. you know, it, in Churchill and uh, Bombay, we'd always have the creamy uh, tomato uh, cheese pastas with fish, prawns, but no more. No, no. Like even today, like there, there was no fair cheese in my. That's uh, an pasta. absolute no. No, it's a bit yeah. like the Bengali, you know, match and doi. You don't really mix, right? No, Bengali is Bengali is mixed match and doi. They do. But, There's something that doesn't. They doesn't. No, mix. no. So we make doi match. But in the Western coast, to so the Maharashtrians, uh, the Parsis, uh, in the in the south, they do not mix dairy and fish, yeah. and nor do the Jews, uh, okay. nor do the Jews. But but Bengalis will mix fish with okay. you do. Okay. Uh, doi. So there's a doi match and the kalia. So where was I? So that happened. So I got fascinated by the food, and I would come back, and I would create those flavors and that food, but there was no one to make it for me. So I had to cook to satisfy my own cravings. So hmm. I bring back all the ingredients, but khana to banana aata nahi tha. I was a spoiled little girl in a big joint family with lots of help. Never entered the kitchen in my life. Um, so I was struggling. I was trying to put something together. And that happened. And then I said, okay, I saw this movie, Julia Roberts, Eat, Pray, Love. Yes. Have you seen that? Yes. I have not, but you, you know, because um, I don't know, just people keep saying it's very... Uh, Woman oriented like, things. So, so, <laughs> you know, we have the book at home as well, and I, probably, I think we probably have the DVD. Now, once I started watching the movie a bit, but I never finished it. Okay, it's a bit of a chick flick because, yeah, she gets yes, fed up yes. of life and says, yes, okay, yes, I'm going yes, to yes. Italy to yes. eat, you know. Yes, yes. And so I decided I'm going to go to Italy to learn to cook. 
um, because I didn't know how to cook and I was struggling. I said, you know what, you can learn everything. So, so, you, so you, you knew how to make gelatos uh, because uh, of your ice cream margin, jeans, right? <laughs> but you didn't know how to cook. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so I did have a patisserie at Mamma Mia. We had a patisserie section, but I had chefs who were doing that. I could not bake a cake. <laughs> I never baked any of those cakes. So that was. You, you knew how to mint money, which is which I, is exactly. probably better. You can be the baking of the cakes to us Bengalis. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and let the Marwari run the business. My best chefs were all Bengalis, so yeah. Yes. Um. Yeah, but you get caught up in branding and the business aspect of any business. So anyways, I enrolled myself in culinary schools in Italy and I learned to cook. And that's the recipes I've shared with you. And um, so that was my time in Italy. And, I've and, and, and was it a problem because uh, you were a uh, vegetarian at that point? And like, for example, uh, I interviewed Kishi Arora, uh, who's now based in uh, Delhi. And she'd gone to the CIA in uh, New York. And, and she was a vegetarian. She is a vegetarian still. So she faced a lot of problems. Uh, and at that time, there was no concept of vegetarian cooking at the CIA. Is 10, 12 years back. So what what about you? So personally, I'm not vegetarian. Um, luckily, so my even, even, was a, even yeah, then, yeah. even then. So we were the Marwaris who ate chicken jab bahar jate restaurant mein, but ghar mein nahi banayenge, you know, we wouldn't. You, you won't be stoned, right? I can, yeah. I can, I don't have to edit this out, right? But then I converted my home. My parents were supportive enough. So, you know, initially my mom had my separate cooking utensils in the separate pan with chicken and fish ka pan hai. Um, so I converted my home. I had never dealt with raw meat, you know, um, for me to deal with the blood and raw meat. It took me some time. Um, but yeah, I did it all and I learned and now I love it. And um, so, yeah, never say never. There's always, you know, a time. And, and then you met your husband in Bangalore. I met my husband in Bangalore. He's, uh, yeah, he was an expat here and yeah. he's actually an excellent cook. Um, and every Italian man, Italian or something. So when I met him, you know, when I spent time in Italy, you know, I came from a home where khana banana was the cook's job or the lady yes. of the house. But, you know, children don't go in the kitchen. Men and children don't apply their mind to khana yes. mein kya hai. Um, so it was a chore. It was a big, important chore to get done for my mom or for the lady of the house, you know. Um, and Indian men were very fussy in those days. So... I saw it as a big job. And when I went to Italy, I saw it as romance, as passion, as something the whole family was involved in. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and I was like, wow, you know, there's something more to food than just filling the stomach. And, and your family's from the south or the north of Italy? You're in from north? south, from Naples. They're yeah, so south, south, south is where they're more, like yes. north, it's still a bit cold, right? Yes. Yeah, like, uh, but, but like even people... South is Mediterranean. Uh, yeah, but oh. south is where like... Like even Spain and uh, because mm-hmm. I, I, I remember like I was a part of the post Milano conference in Milan, but before that also when I was uh, speaking at the Casa Asia conference in uh, in in uh, Spain in Barcelona, yeah. they were talking of the same thing that how in southern Italy and Spain it's 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 all about family a bit like India, but north is a bit different. Yeah, north is a bit different. So that's more of the German, French, Northern yeah. Europe influence. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I saw the men cook and my husband cook. Now first date, he invited. By the way, if you invite a girl for lunch on your first date and you are confident enough to cook a meal, like that <laughs> pasta con melanzane, the tomato yeah. with eggplant. I think I mentioned that's my husband. Yes, yes, I, I love that. Yes. So he cooked that, and I said, "Bengal, like somebody can glorify." You know, <laughs> India with bengal is like bengal. You know? <laughs> like, yes. Um, so yeah, so if you could glorify bengal, so obviously food was a big connect, and I learned a lot. Because I was the madam who could not cut my own onions and who could not clean up the kitchen after cooking because I, you know, I always had help. So my husband taught me all that. We, I mean, we met here and my father was an excellent cook. So what I loved and learned from the Italians or from my in-laws today is how cooking is not a woman's job. Um, men are equally involved. Kids are involved. And it's something to enjoy. You know, it's fun. It's not calm. So my dad was, um, uh, I mean, he passed on when I was pretty young, when I was nine years old, but um, he'd gone to the UK to uh, study and he was abroad for about 14 years, if you take it on at the end. So after marriage, mom went there. So my mom didn't know how to cook because she's from a uh, house, Bengali family in Delhi, where my grandparents would fo- ask her to focus on studies. Yeah. So my dad actually taught her to cook and he, he used to say that he had to learn how to cook because uh, as a student, that was the only way to survive. I'm talking of the you know late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. 
so i've grown up on stories of my dad being a cook so when we got married uh, then uh, we couldn't afford a house help so we started cooking and for me there was a lot of joy in that though now my mom says that for my dad it was more like after marriage it was like a one off thing not not like uh, you know regular stuff and the kitchen wouldn't be clean at the end of it but uh, i can't verify those stories but i can <laughs> <laughs> but um I came across a very incident, uh, interesting incident recently, and that's why I found your book also quite interesting in that uh, trend. So I was um, judging the a cooking contest in a international school in uh, uh, Bombay, and this was for uh, people who were kids who were uh, seven to nine years old. So it it was online, of course, and they had to pair up with parents. So there was one case where there was a young boy and his dad, and they'd made these sliders, you know, and and they were like. a poor thing I was, I was really pushing for them because the food also looked good to, for them to win but they were other better even better things but they were very enthusiastic this boy and his son said the boy and his dad so then i um, you know asked them that uh, do you guys cook often so then the dad said that uh, we've been cooking together through the lockdown and uh, that's the only way that's the only exciting thing we had in uh, life so they probably li- live in a condo in uh, central uh, mumbai so i think that um, during the the pandemic especially and, and especially the first few lockdowns where uh, you know middle class to upper middle class india was bereft of house help and household so suddenly you were living the you know you're living the european life in the sense that you had to cook yeah. you had to do the bartans everything yeah. and you had to also think local because nothing would get imported so um that's when a lot of cooking happened and like you written in your book that um, from the time when you were trying to learn how to cook which is 10 12 years back there weren't really blogs then like even no, in the beginning we would get websites and books but now there are blogs and uh, things like that so when i went through your book uh, it reminded me a lot of uh, first of all i must uh, compliment you on uh, you know the the quality of the uh, the print which which one really finds in indian uh, cookbooks which is such a shame because we have such good production in our magazines you know condenast and uh, vogue and stuff like that but the styling is is beautiful or uh, even the reproduction sorry <laughs> yeah. uh stuff like that so it, it it makes it makes it very appealing and then what i like was when i was going through the recipes there were tips then there were tips on uh, what to do with if you had extra stuff left so we we something which uh, you know one you started doing during the lockdown because uh, you didn't have access to too much in fact i even started a hashtag uh, for myself love your leftovers uh, it reminded me a bit of uh, one of jamie oliver's books yeah. uh, which uh, i bought or my wife had given me to the, the beginning uh, years of her marriage and i found that also very interesting in terms of uh, the pictures would uh, sort of draw you in and there were all these tips how to make you you know make a pasta and then use it for different Uh, sort of things yeah 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 so so when you were uh, doing uh, this book uh, what was your thought like what were you what were you trying to uh, achieve through this book what did you want your readers to take out because see now there's there there's youtube there's you know uh, reels and uh, blogs and stuff like that so to make a book stand out what what were you trying to uh, what was your aim Go. So I am a very practical, no frills, keep it straight and simple person. Um, this is really a reflection of my own life. Um, you know, I have two kids. I'm a working mom, mm. and uh, I just thought, see, recipe the sabko milta. You get recipes on the internet, and the chefs were way better than me. Of But course, the practical yeah. aspect, you see, we are not. I, if you're not a chef, you're not going to spend all day in the kitchen making the fanciest of dishes. You have half an hour or one hour. You have to put a meal together. um you know you have work you have other issues and the lockdown you're cooking breakfast lunch and dinner and you have the fussy spouse and the fussy kids um so it's a very practical approach you know what do you do with leftovers i preach batch cooking um so very western moving towards a western lifestyle um yeah. because maybe you can't because you can have house help but the house help will make you dal chawal sabzi um, exactly you know so so banu will make the for for dinner our cook Uh, I've beefed her to make the jinghe posto, the Bengali yeah. thing, which I've taught her. So you know, when I teach her Bengali stuff, which is Indian, with regular guidance, she gets it right. But anything yeah. which is 
non indian yeah. that meat or she won't like you like you said i mean it's, it's because if you haven't tasted something how can you expect your husband mm. so they send their house help to me to teach her to cook i said but she's not going to cook the way you would cook yes so coming back to the book it's very practical uh, it tells you about batch cooking make a big batch of sauce or a salad to use this in a sandwich tomorrow hmm. Yes. Go ahead. I'm just showing you. Yeah. So it's about using the salad. <laughs> you've seen it. You've seen it. Tomorrow, it's about using sauces for a crostini. The same red pepper sauce can be made into a pasta sauce. A dip can become a pasta sauce. Um, yeah. it's just about saving time. Also, I it's all about Indian ingredients. You know, the biggest headache of anyone's okay. I'm gonna take out. She takes you take out a fancy recipe from an American blog, but that means you have to head to a nature's basket or a food hall, which is at the other end of town, and not your local. sabzi wala ya kon kinara dukan so one day it's just gone and trying to get the ingredients and it's expensive yes. um not everyone has budget true um and it's processed and travel the whole world so simple thing i do a risotto with bali a indian jaw which is an old indian you know rajasthan grain which cost 20 rupees versus 500 rupees for that arborio rice um is it a millet is it a would you call it a millet no not a millet no bali is not a millet but it's that hmm. family um But it's low, low, low. I low might glycemic. be wrong. It might be a millet. Jo ar bar. But it's but it's low, low glycemic index and everything, right? Sorry. It's it's low glycemic. Yeah, index, yeah, it is. Right? So yeah, it's very healthy. It's more diabetic water. friendly and and barley water is very healthy. It's a lemon barley. It's the same thing we use. The lemon barley. Robinson barley. Exactly. <laughs> Um, the other thing was the simple thing like ricotta cheese is basically paneer. I blend it in the blender, clean, and I have fooled the best of Italians. Trust me. But desi paneer becomes ricotta. And salt it really well. Whip it up really well. It becomes a whipped feta. Okay, um, it works. So that's what my book is about. That you know what you have enough complications in life. Don't make your food complicated. Um, so yeah. yeah. No, I I found uh, two things very interesting in what you uh, said. First was the fact uh, that you were sort of comparing with what a chef, what you'd expect from a chef. versus you see so for me i mean that is what really uh, the entire blogging uh, movement started off that you had regular people who are not chefs sharing uh, their recipes so like you said i mean they wouldn't necessarily be uh, expert cooks or uh, you know things like that but when you see them and and now a lot of uh, that would be instagram perhaps or uh, or even youtube but when you see them like you feel that okay if if um, you know if Uh, this lady who's a working person who's not really trained and has his time staff can cook or if this guy uh, can uh, can cook then so can i like that uh, you know the show was if yan can cook uh, so can i and i think the other very interesting point which you said is about uh, ingredients yeah. so uh, you know i got married in um, 2001 so we've been sort of cooking since then and uh, in the beginning ingredients uh, were not that available and they were very expensive so as a young couple Like you really save up and buy maybe a smoked salmon or an expensive cheese from the Oberoi uh, hotel charcuterie or some meats or you know uh, even cream cheese and things like that. And then when maybe affordability was not that much of an issue when we were in middle management, sourcing was. So we still live in an uh, area in Bandra uh, where there are expats and there's Pali market where you can buy stuff. And then came Nature's Mara baskets and food okay. hall and um, all of that. and and i think what the pandemic has shown is that uh it's it's really like the prime minister says vocals for local so uh, i mean imports and all that is not going to be that easy so where hoteliers and all are focusing on that and like you said i mean giving ideas like taking paneer and making ricotta yeah is uh so now um you also do uh, uh pop ups and workshops and all that so tell us a bit about that How did that come about? How did it start? So and what happened first? Was it was a book first or the pop-ups and workshops first? Sorry, was the book first? What, what came first, the books or the pop-ups and workshops? So I started teaching um, when we came back to. I told you about you know when I sold my brand, just where you know where I started. I moved to Bangalore. Um, I had two kids, um, you know, new mom. But in my time off, while we were living in Singapore, after I sold my company, I started cooking on a cooking marathon because I wanted to teach myself. And I saw TV shows, and I did tutorials with chefs, and I attended cooking, you know, schools in Singapore also. So I learned Asian cooking as well. And um, I started cooking, and then 
I love to feed people. So yes, we would have parties all the time. I said, my husband's a great cook and so it was like something we would do together. But and where all my friends who would come, their first question was, listen, can you please teach me how to make this? Listen, my biggest thing is, you know, my <laughs> husband and I are always fighting over the food in the house. Um, so then, and I also tried my hand when we moved to Bangalore, catering, you know, I would take orders for parties. So then I realized I'm sitting in the kitchen, getting hot and sweaty, and I'm just dealing with the maid and the driver <laughs> who's coming. I haven't even met the client or seen the client's face. So I was missing the people element. Um, and people wanted to learn. So I said, why don't I enhance somebody, teach somebody, and they can cook in their home. And because, and then, you know, as a family, food is a bond. Yeah, you have a nice meal on the table as compared to having dal chawal. And the whole atmosphere changes. You know, it's exciting. When I was young, my mom would follow Tarla Dalal books. You remember Tarla Dalal? Yes, yes. yes. And it was like, huh, I'm, I'm cooking something fancy, you know? Yes. And everybody would be on the table together. So it's also well-being as if I can contribute and make that family happy. So that's when I started my workshop. Um, I started very small from the house. You know, people didn't even know who I was. Um, lots of blunders along the way. Lots of cancelled workshops because nobody would turn up. Um, I did it around Bangalore. And that's how it started. And then the blog started. Instagram started. And, and the blog is called what? The blog is called Kuchina Mia by Natasha, but honestly, and, and, and is that the same as your website? Because uh, that I, is my website. My website is the yeah, the, but but very nicely done. I must say that it it makes it very easy to navigate and you yeah. know go to places or understand where. So uh, did, did you do it uh, by yourself, the website or designing, or did you involve uh, a professional? So the help? website design, I got a professional. I'm not a technical person at all. But what I did learn um, was food photography. So as I said, I was busy having kids and I was in the mommy world of play dates and Instagram happened. So I'm talking yes. about, you know, when 2016, 2017, mm -hmm. I surfaced into the world and said, I want to do something. And my friend said, yeah, start Insta get an Instagram page. I said, who the hell is Instagram now? One more bloody thing to learn. Yeah, I know. I, know. I used to think it was a photo editing tool at the beginning. Yeah. So I went and learned food photography. Um, because the first thing, you know, that's what you need to learn. So, so you went to a course? Uh, to I did a course with a very renowned food photographer in Bangalore. Okay. And then I kept following Instagram and following other photographers. And that's the beauty of Instagram. Yes. And learning and getting inspiration and practicing myself. Um, and the book, I have styled every picture in that, by the way. No, um, it's, it's really, it, it draws you in. And, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of uh, cookbooks and I, and I would always feel that why is it that the quality one sees in Instagram or even blogs yeah. uh, or, or in magazines, you just don't seem to see that in published cookbooks in India. And, yeah. and, and when, when, if you see cookbooks published by uh, Indians who live abroad, like whether it's Asma, uh, Monica, you know, or, or Mira Soda and all these folks, it's, it's so nice. I mean, they, it's so inviting. Yeah, so food styling is a thing. And yeah, I did, I, I guess my style does have a very, um, you know, international look, uh, very neat and clean look where the food stands out. So I learned that, got onto Instagram, one thing led to another. Workshops are very successful. As you can see, I do very simple stuff and people liked my very simple approach because you want to come to a class and you want to cook the stuff you've learned. Yes. You don't want to just go to the class, spend that time and money and say, oh God, it's too complicated. You know, when am I going to make it? And that's I mean, the best, best best cooking classes which I've attended are like that, whether it's Pooja Dingra's chocolate making class or uh, Chef Moshe's, uh, you know, medze making classes and stuff like that. They, they, they make it all so simple yeah. that, that you want to go back and try it. They and of course, the ones abroad in, in Spain or France or Thailand, they all make it so user-friendly. Yeah. You have to assume the other person is not a chef like you and maybe, yes. you know, is starting off much lower level of knowledge and expertise. Yes. Um, and so serve their purpose. So what is their purpose and solve that. So the workshops happened and I did all India I started moving around to other cities as well. And then of course, once the lockdown and everything happened, I've gone 100% online. And, and, and you also uh, uh, did uh, pop-ups, right? With restaurants. Yes. Like even recently, uh, something in Rajasthan, uh, you were doing... Rajasthan, I, I shot a video. So I've been, I'm, I saw it's my dream to, so if you know anybody who can help me with the travel and food uh, show. So I have a 
Um, I love <laughs> if I find the person, I will jump onto the person myself. So. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can do a show together. Yes, no, and, and, and also now it's really the age of, I think, doing stuff by yourself, like even your book, like you can wait for the right publisher. But I, I think the lockdown has really yeah. been about people starting their own uh, things. So I yeah, also so you, talking about the pop-ups. I did, yeah. So then I, you know, someone said, okay, why don't you do a pop-up? So I've been doing some dinner pop-ups around Bangalore. So that's when my chef hat comes in. And but I what do you enjoy more? Do you, do, do you enjoy, do you enjoy the cookie of uh, the, the teaching more or the pop-ups uh, more? Well, they're both different. The pop-ups, there's a lot of work involved um, and it's very stressful. And, you know, you got to, and I do pop-ups like 25 people at a stretch and I don't have my own team. So I work with someone else's team. Yes. Um, the cooking workshops are more relaxed. Like you're chatting with other, you know, men and women, and you're learning. A, it's more chilled out. Whereas in a pop up, you're put on the stage, and it's like, oh my god, and the people are like being very critical. Um, you know, so they're both different. But then when you do a pop up and you nail it, and people are happy, you're like, yes, yeah. I did it. You know. Um, mm. So again, I do stuff which people have not tasted here. The kind of food, very Mediterranean, very Italian. I get a lot of ingredients. My father-in-law, by the way, so very supportive in laws is my biggest supplier and biggest teacher. So I get the Amalfi lemons and the Parmigiano, which is aged, you know, just right. Um, so yeah, that's what I do. And then the book happens. So it was my dream to write a book. Um, so as you can see, I do dream a lot and I do believe in working towards the dream. Um, yeah, a lot of us dream a lot. So that, I think you also executed. I think that's, that's the second part, which is yeah. important as well. And then the book happened. Um, I started writing the book before the lockdown and the lockdown happened, which delayed everything. But then the lockdown, for some it was a pain, for some it was a gain. Um, and for me it was a gain because we still released a book um, and because everyone was at home, it's been very well received, the book. So That's that. wonderful. And, and you said that uh, you moved uh, your workshops completely to an online uh, platform and, and you were also telling me that now you're going to stay that way because you more because you enjoy it and not just because you're forced to it. But now uh, what, what I found interesting is that you started the workshops because uh, you were missing the human element at work, right? And, and this entire joy of interacting with people, like even the few workshops which I've done myself or when I conduct food walks, you know, having the people around you talking this, that, and now you are here and, and your audience is somewhere else. And you're actually just talking to a ca camera or a laptop. Um, you know, so how, do, how does that feel? Don't you, don't you miss that? I do miss that, but um, <clears throat> it's saving me time and traffic. It's saving me, um, I'm being able to reach out to people who are all around the world. I have people from the US and UK logging in, you know, as for their timing. Um, I have people all over India logging in. Um, so that's the difference where I have a broader reach and we chat on Zoom, the way I do it on Zoom, so the way you and I are chatting right now. Yes, yes. Um, I've met so many people who I would not have met had I only visited to Bangalore. They've become my regular students. Um, so yeah, it's okay. It's got its pros and cons. <laughs> no, yeah, it's, it's true, you know. Yeah. So this photocracy for her, like, uh, is, is something, like, for a couple of years, I've been thinking of doing something which to do with... Uh, you know, uh, women entrepreneurs. And like you, I was also thinking in terms of, uh, you know, TV shows, because that's how we think conventionally. And I even spoke to a producer and all that. And, and there was an issue of interest or how to get sponsor money. And then where will we shoot the budgets and all that. And that never happened. But then have, the lockdown started and one saw people doing lives on Instagram. And, and that's how it started. And then later, uh, when I did an interview with uh, Pooja Dhingra, I moved into Zoom and then I can, because now people don't always hook on to lives. So this you yeah. can put up and people can watch at their leisure. Yeah. And it's meant to be an hour long chat and yeah. you know, things like that. But uh, the, but now look, I'm sitting in Mumbai and I'm, I'm taking and talking to you in Bangalore. I've spoken to people in Jamshedpur, uh, Gohati, Jaipur, wherever. And, and like you, I hate traveling in Bombay. So, uh, you know, the idea of, say, if I had to go to someone's house in Napian Sea Road or someone's house in Kandivni, you know, uh, how much it, time it you're saving on the road. <laughs> yes. So it's, it's a new way of living. So it's like even your, whatever, like you're planning, like your shows and stuff, I, I think it's a completely different way of thinking. Now, I want to ask you something on food trends, uh, since you've been doing uh, workshops and uh, things like that, that I remember when BBC Good Food launched in India the first time, not the current version, 
but the first time they've done a they've done some sort of uh, market research and i think what came out at that time uh, which was a bit of a shocker was that the international cuisine which is most popular in india and i'm talking maybe 8 10 years back was italian food and the shocker was because at that time and if you think 10 years back you think that most popular is chinese right back then uh, or, yeah, or maybe thai or something like yeah. that but um and, and so um what is the sort of um, trend that you see now among your students or people who approach you for uh, workshops what is the sort of food which people are uh, looking for at at workshops like yours i think the key word is healthy um that's my experience the key word is healthy so less oil non fried um local ingredients again and uh, then it could be asian it could be thai of course there's a whole vegetarianism and the vegan trend which makes asian food very vegan friendly um yes italian i do a lot of mediterranean italian that's also very popular um because that again uses a lot of chickpeas and beans and stuff like yes. that um you know the mediterranean diet my next book i'm writing my next book by the way that's all about around the mediterranean um but of course that will have non veg elements uh, but i'm just talking about um the trend is healthy um mm. so i think all cuisines um but with a compromise on taste because there's a, the understanding is that in india here i mean people talk of health and all of that but finally it comes down to taste right so so it's, italian it's not... food yes it is popular um but i think people they have italian two days and then they want something spicy and... no no i'm i'm talking of this health versus taste thing because okay. uh, you know one uh, line of thought is that in india is still taste which huh. rules so when you're talking of healthy is it at the cost of taste or is it like taste no not at the cost how to make it healthier it's tasty yeah. and healthy yeah it has to be tasty of course no i think that's where like someone uh, if if i look at say someone like you um you're also like a mom of two kids who are like 4 and 6 so as a as a mom you're thinking also in terms of what's going into their uh bodies in terms of this thing so i think that that so do you think that that reflects the way you think when you are creating uh stuff i mean of course you're cooking for adults not for kids but that it does reflect for kids and for myself it definitely does but tasty can be healthy and healthy can be tasty simple thing you replace your maida with atta uh um, you reduce the amount of sugar use olive oil or cold pressed oil instead of that commercial you know the dalda the sunflower oil we grew up on um if you have to fry i do french fries in the oven now i do oven baked yes. fries you don't need that oil you know um and they're as crispy and they're as tasty so a lot of oven use um if you just want to talk about a trend also there's a lot of oven use which is indian kitchens never had an oven yeah yeah even cakes would be in pressure cookers but exactly. now there are ovens there are air fryers there are microwaves with a uh, you know combo uh, sort of things yeah and uh, that's the trend yeah. and i um, think that the other thing which happens is when you start um you know exploring boundaries in your own kitchen yeah is that you realize that you can bring in uh, a lot of flavor with uh, you know limited amount of stuff versus in in restaurants like in restaurants once they have their budget and the costing done they might be uh, like a lot of butter put in or a lot of meat put in or a, you know a lot of olive oil put in or things like that but with smaller amounts but more you know conscious and detailed cooking you can extract uh, those sort of flavors at home right and yeah uh, so pr- probably those are some some things which uh, people explore in the workshops you uh, yeah, you sort of people yeah about um, about bringing a lot of flavor sorry i didn't get you what was your question again I, I... no my question was that when you're doing commercial cooking yeah versus uh, when you're cooking at home yeah then there's a lot with a lot of um, care at home you can extract maximum uh, flavor yes from ingredients which um, you know in, in commercial cookings you know you might often take the easier way out with a lot of fat oil uh, you that know things like different. that yes being in the industry um, i have seen what happens in the commercial kitchens and i know that you know if i go out and that's why i'm very critical if i go out and i in the asian food chinese food we all like that spicy Indian Chinese, yeah. kind of, but the same thing. I know how much corn flour has gone in that. Oh, it leaves you with such a heavy fe- feeling. Yeah, that you know, oodles of corn flour. I know what's gone in the chicken. They've used the cheapest cuts of the chicken in the restaurant. Yeah. 
So yes, and, you and it's also stored for long. It's not necessarily it's yeah. It's not fresh. They use cheap ingredients, like cheap vinegar and cheap uh, seasoning, cheap soy sauce, and not the nice kikoman soy sauce, which is you know without GMS and stuff. Um, so you can recreate the same flavors at home and just feel that you're eating clean. Um, and I think that's what the lockdown also did. People were cooking at home and they realized that I have friends who've lost, they said we've lost weight and we're feeling fresher and healthier and because you're not going to office. So you're not eating, you know, my husband was eating home food yes. and not some food court ka khana. Um, so you can recreate the same flavors at home. Just have to be organized and use, the, obviously you will use good ingredients. Yes. And there is a big difference. Yes. I also want to ask you one more thing on trends that I also saw that there is... Uh... Um, and Indian section, or there's some Indian recipes in your uh, book yeah. as well. Um, now, uh, uh, you know, when you when you read uh, publications or when you see trending restaurants or when you see what food writers like us write or you know, chefs and all that, uh, there is this movement with a sort of a back to the roots sort of thing and with a lot of focus on uh, Indian food and uh, you know, a lot of chefs like Pratik Sadhu Thomas Zakaria, Amrindan Sadhu, yeah. they're all, all speaking about that. Um, but um, what's your experience when you're dealing with uh, your, your students or people who interact with you on Instagram or on the book? Uh, is this like this rapid, sudden reversal of everyone wants to now cook what their grandmother cooks? Or is the Indian consumer looking at world food as well and, and flavors like that? What is your experience? So I like to say it's like old wine in a new bottle. Yes. Um, you know, I think people are going back to their roots and I myself like to crave, you know, like I was in Rajasthan um, a few weeks ago in Jaipur and I made this bajre, bajra ka yes. salad. Now I'm yes. Marwadi and bajra is, you know, bajre ki kijri, um, or, you know, bajre ki roti was always a deli was something made at home, but I never looked at it twice. Um, yeah. Today I'm cooking with bajra. So I think it's about ingredients. And now the latest thing is, you know, turmeric, cauliflower, and you make cauliflower wrap, <laughs> yes. uh, you know, everything else. So what I do is I take, I teach people, encourage people for modern, what we call modern Indian or urban Indian. So your simple sabzi or simple aloo gobi or your chana, put it into a pita bread, you know, make, instead of a raita, make a sabzi ki. It's all the same, you know, if you read this book, uh, I read this book by Veer Sangvi, The Indian Pantry. Yes, yes. And he talks about how historic, in the end, we, you know, we all eat the same food and <laughs> it's all same, same, but different. Um, I've been actually been trying to trace the comparison between the pizza and the naan. Pizza, pizza bread, naan. It's all very similar, the dough, you know, it's just that ek tan exactly. mein banta hai, ek mein banta hai. And, and if you see the, the, the thin crust uh, pizzas, I uh, remember the first time I had it was in uh, Montreux which is uh, the more Italian side of Switzerland. Um, uh, when I had it, the base sort of reminded me more of a naan, you know? Yeah. And that sort of thing came to India a bit later. But uh, I, I still remember I was in Calcutta in 1881 when uh, the, the first pizza place had opened somewhere in Kamek Street and my dad had got me a box of a, a pizza. And that was, of course, a thick thing full of cheese. But I think that's very interesting. And, and it's, you know, back to back. So the last episode, which I did on Foodocracy for her, which, uh, which was with uh, Tanaz Godiwala, who's this legendary Parsi caterer. Okay. And, and she made this point that a lot of the new couples getting married, uh, a lot of the guests who are coming in are non-Parsi. So they want to give a taste of Parsi food at the time of the wedding. So, yeah. so Tanaz has also come up with things where she does tartlets, for example, with sali chicken. So just yeah. like you said, I mean, take a gobi masala and put it in a, a, a pita bread. Or even like what I did today, I mean, uh, I, I use a sort of a classic tomato sauce and I put in a whole uh, pomme frites. While five years back, we would have tried to source a Norwegian smoked salmon or, or like some cod yeah. or, or basa, which, you know, basa in the beginning, our first time I came across it was a cafe in uh, Bandra and it was written Vietnamese basa. I don't know, wow, Vietnamese basa <laughs> sounds so exotic. And then, uh, you know, later one, <laughs> yeah, it's... Yeah. it's uh, so, you know, it's it's been a year uh, since the pandemic. Uh, a lot of ideas which people had in the beginning, now they're wondering with things changing, whether that still makes sense. Because, you know, this whole thing of what to cook, uh, now house help is back. Um, restaurants and cafes are back. Uh, they're, they're sort of delivering in and stuff. But I still see 
that some of the trends which had started are going strong. Like for example, the home chef business, because now once people realize what wonderful food they can uh, offer, it's yeah. not that home chefs have gone out of business. No. So what about uh, people like you who are teaching people how to cook? Are people still interested in knowing how to cook? Or do they, because or are they putting their feet up? I think people were a bit tired of cooking for so long as well. Um, especially women and especially those who have kids at home, um, you know, it's been a lot. So I think people have started going out a bit, but now with the second wave, we might, I don't know what there is in store. Um, people did learn to cook a lot. A lot of men, I, this book has taught a lot of men, by the way. I think I say it this is, It is, yeah. Yeah, I, I can quite imagine, yes. So you, you had uh, a lot of uh, men yes. going through this and cooking as well? Messaging me, thanking me, and uh, saying we've been trying. And I, so that's what I think I saved your marriage. Yeah, you owe me one <laughs> for saving your marriage. <laughs> it's been tough, you know, it's been tough for people. Um, like, for example, this one, like uh, the mango oh, and black rice try it. salad. I mean, black rice is coming from, uh, you know, Assam and Mizoram. Yeah. And, and you can use like a desi mango, so you don't necessarily, you don't need is there any avocado anywhere? No, I don't think we have. There is avocados some avocado. in it. But avocado no, is also in, in, now. No, no, not in this recipe, is it? No, not in this one. I, I don't think so. But yeah, but what I'm saying is that, like, it's a lot of, uh, yeah, there is one ripe avocado diced. But I think in uh, Bangalore, where you are, anyway, they grow avocado in yes, Karnataka. It's very seasonal yes. also. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, see, you are also a, a business person. You've. Uh, you know, seen businesses through different life cycles. So what I would like to um, know as, as we are sort of closing is that as, as a business person putting that hat on, what do you think is the, um, uh, you know, the prospect for this entire workshopping uh, sort of uh, thing, and especially in the case of uh, cooking, like, uh, like for people like you who are now moving online for cooking classes, or you're coming up with more cooking books, uh, do you think that uh, the interest which had, you know, sort of spurted in a sense uh, is, is still there? Is there a market for what you're doing? Is it time to sell off and maybe make ice well, creams? Like any other business, I think it's up to the entrepreneur to keep it interesting. Yeah, so when it was an ice cream business, I had to create new flavors all the time because a customer would say, Naya kya hai? Are wo to kha liya. So same <laughs> way with the workshop, I need to keep creating new stuff. So I just did a cheese board assembly, you know, a cheese board a workshop. I talked about cheeses, I talked about wine, how to put it together. Completely different, completely new, and people loved it. You know, so if I'm still gonna go on with the same kana banana, um, it's not gonna happen. Now it's summertime, so I'm doing an all new homemade gelato workshop. Um, so you gotta be very seasonal, very in the context. Those with kids, their kids are on summer vacation very soon. So I'm doing something where kids cooking. So you've got to keep reinventing and giving people new stuff um, to get them interested. That's what I feel. And, and how do those ideas come? And I'll tell you why I'm asking that. Because when, when you look at social media, then you see various trends coming up. And sometimes uh, as someone who is an individual like you are, it gets a bit overwhelming. It's okay if you're running a magazine or yeah. you know it's a restaurant where there are multiple chefs. But if you're doing everything by yourself, it gets a bit overwhelming, right? If you try to sort of chase trends and do this and do that and whatever. So when, you, when you're looking at innovating, how, how do the ideas come to you? The ideas come through. My first thing is I believe in hearing the customer. So I always ask people, what would, should I do next? What would you like to learn? What would you like to see? Um, trends, yes, of course. Um, so it's also about hearing people and some say, you know what, I really want to learn this. You should plan this or you should think about this. Um, I really want to do Mexican or I want to learn something, something specific about Mexican because people are very exposed now. Thanks to the internet, yes. they know yes. what the, what's right and what's wrong. You can't bullshit. Um, yes. And they want to, you know, learn and be fancy. Some, even food photography, that's a big in demand, I think, because people want to, even if you're making dal chawal, how do I make it look glamorous? And, and using regular equipment like phones yeah. and natural light. Yeah. Because not everyone will have those, no. uh, you know, cameras so and those. Natural uh, light. Yeah, all those yeah, umbrellas and light. Um, so I yeah. talk about natural light. Use thermocol boards in you know simple crockery and simple table mats. Um, so it's just about hearing what the customer wants, and then you got to work hard and design it to suit them, and not try and sell what you want to do or what what's convenient for you. That's what I believe in. Lovely. 
And, um, you know, uh, uh, I, I think this lockdown for most people uh, who run businesses uh, or who work has probably sort of thrown the sort of uh, problems or barriers which one had never thought of. And, and, and a lot of people like you have shown how to sort of circumvent that and overcome that and, and then uh, go ahead from where one was. So um, uh, what are your learnings which you'd like to sort of share with people who are now, you know, themselves at a deadlock and wondering how to go ahead? So are there any learnings which you'd like to uh, share? Sure. Um, so like any business, so, okay, lockdown, COVID, this is all, it's like I, so my husband's family, they're from Southern Italy, which was affected by war. The world war, yeah? The, like, yes. I hear of their grandfathers and things, and you know, their family who migrated to. And then life completely changed. Um, so I, I look at this whole lockdown as a revolution in history, which means you got to change with the situation and the thing yes. and not fight it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are a lot of my friends there who are business and they're just trying to be optimistic and optimistic. Optimistic is one thing, but I'm a business person. I'm realistic, <laughs> you know, okay. I like that. Realistic. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I like that. Not negative. Optimistic. Realistic. Ah. You know, for yes. me, I can't hope for two plus two to be five. Two plus two will always be four. You know. Um, so yeah, you got to adapt. You have to change. You have to adapt. And that's what restaurants have done. They've gone on with the delivery in the cloud kitchen. Um, you have to adapt or you have to just, you know, temp, you know what they say, the storm will eventually pass. So you got to be strong enough to weather the storm. Um, but you got to do something. You got to act. So what, what has been the biggest sort of adaptation so to speak, that you've done? Is it is it the workshop? Or, I or went online. Are, as in moving workshop. online? Is, is that, is yeah. moving online the biggest? Uh, moving person? online was the biggest thing for me. It also worked personally because I have two kids at home who have been home for yes. one year. Um, yes. So no. I need to be home as well and not be known because my husband is going to office. That was a big thing. It was also a game because I could reach out to the world and, you know, my book, also, I could publicize more with people spending more time online. So, you know, America, UK, we've sold on through Amazon. Again, Amazon, thanks to technology. Oh. You know, you don't have to. And, 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 and the printed copy or uh, e-copies? No, printed. When you're copy. selling abroad? Printed copy. Printed. Oh. So you, because I self-publish, Amazon, just for information, has this Kindle Direct Publishing, where you just upload your file, and it's printed in the US somewhere when somebody orders, and oh. it goes. And same quality or like quality, yes. I've had my family. Wow. Um, wow. So I adapt like that. The book I'm also, I'm also writing my next book because I've accepted that there's not too much external activity happening. We did yes, one, yes. You know, I did a dinner pop up. Okay, just but just but you know now it's not going to happen. When there was a little window of being open, so I can't do dinners. I need to earn also. So I said, okay, let me take this time, write my next book. And it's something I can market long distance. I didn't even see my publisher face. My publishers were in Chennai. I was in Bangalore. We have never met. But they designed the book and everything happened long distance. So I'm also questioning the need for doing things physically. Yes. Um, you know, we haven't been visiting restaurants. We order the same food all the time. So I, I'm very pro restaurants cutting down their yes. seating capacity and all that. Um, we've stopped going out at night too much. You do get early drinks. So life has changed. And I'm not sure how much we'll eventually get back. It will take time. I think the whole world has to be vaccinated and the vaccine has to work. True. I, I, yeah, I, I think that that's a, uh, I think that's a wonderful attitude to have because, you know, the way things are, one can't really predict. Like even like you were talking about Southern Italy, I mean, the war happened and then there were so many things after that. There were dictatorships yeah. and, and, and so many other things and, you know, uh, stuff, but I think what you said. I mean, be optimistic, but also be realistic. Uh, learn to uh, adapt, and and also maybe uh, do things differently, and realize that things which we had never thought is possible, yeah, uh, is possible now. I mean, and starting with uh, the chat. I mean, we are sitting in two different parts of the country. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and uh, you know, parts of the country, and we are talking, and and of course, someday uh, we'll also meet and. Uh, Maybe uh, sort of cook together or something. Or, or but don't lose thing. money. If you're a business, if somebody's in business, I would say don't just sit around, keep tea ho jayega. Shayad tea nahi hoga, or you lose too much money. So do something. Yeah, so, so, so invest 
only what you know you can make make uh, yeah. like don't uh, sink in too much at this point <laughs> yes so, so that's um, uh, wise words from natasha chelmi who's also uh, natasha chelmi ni agarwal so so the <laughs> the chelmi part of it i think has uh, influenced her cooking uh, which is <laughs> while the agarwal part is where i think the business sense uh, uh, comes in so thanks a lot uh, natasha thanks for chatting with us and uh, and i hope you guys uh, enjoyed this and please uh, share the video so that uh, like more people can uh, watch it and hear it yes thank you kalyan thanks so much it was a pleasure and good fun yeah chatting together and hope you picked up it from my book send me a picture if you cook something i i i already did it in a way in a way i did it it was like okay not not fully one fourth or one fifth but uh, then uh, yeah I, you know i'm not much of a recipe book person but what i do is i take ideas like this nice. and then uh, you know uh, take it on but but it's a it's a lovely book and and it's uh, definitely like i said it's it entices one to sort of uh, cook from it so who knows maybe i might <laughs> I might definitely but uh, thanks so much thanks take care thank you bye, bye.